taking the bull by the horns, or did Greece's left-wing government just cave in faster than usual? There were bitter protests in Athens and Thessaloniki against harsh new tax and pension reforms. This uh, leading up to a vote in Parliament that's aimed at preempting reform demands that are part of a standoff with creditors on debt relief. All sides have known for a long time that Greece can't pay back the sums borrowed first by the banks and by fellow states in the IMF. Uh, even the funds rooting for debt relief at this point, but not the Germans, it seems, although now there's an open split with an Angela Merkel's grand coalition on the matter. What is a fair deal for all sides? What's changed in nine years of crisis? And does Greece see the light at the end of the tunnel? Also, is the Eurozone any better equipped to withstand another crisis? Today, in the France 24 debate, it's payback time again in Greece. And with us from Athens is uh, Yanis Palaiologos, author of The 13th Labor of Hercules. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back from Hania in Crete, an economist who's thought long and hard about the pros and cons of the Eurozone, Yanis Koutsoumidis. And from London, Alberto Gallo, portfolio manager at Algebris Investments. Welcome to all of you, the France Venquette debate where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F2 for debate. Greece and its EU IMF creditors uh, to reach a deal to release the next tranche of bailout money in the coming days. That's according to an EU commissioner speaking just a few hours ago. The relief, though, comes at a cost as protesters rioted outside amid a general strike. Three votes was the margin inside Parliament as the left-wing Syriza government narrowly got approval uh, on those reforms. The Prime Minister accused of betraying his electoral base, but it seems that Alexei Tsipras prefers to weather this storm than the, the one he faces in July, when his government has to make a 2.3 billion euro debt repayment. We are determined, at all costs, to make Greece stand on its feet again, and to break this abscess of corruption that was governing all these years and led the country to bankruptcy. And we will do it. It's another year with the same movie repeating itself. It's been playing for the last six years. Every year, pensions and salaries go down, while taxes increase, employer contributions increase, everything increases. I don't know where this is going to lead. They didn't do what they said they would. And now people have to decide what's next. No one's paying attention to the strikes, neither on one side or the other. We need a revolution. Seriously, my politics were in the center, but now I'm thinking of going towards the extremes. I'm so outraged. Yanis Palaiologos, your reaction to that 58-year-old uh, unemployed man saying that uh, no one's paying attention anymore when there's a general strike, we need a revolution. Well, I think uh, if you consider what uh, has happened to my country over the last uh, six, seven years, we were talking about a country that's been in recession basically uninterruptedly for eight years. It's been forced to take austerity measures, very harsh ones, uh, continuously over six years. And uh, the economy hasn't recovered. People are still losing their jobs. Unemployment is at 25 percent and has been there for four years now. Um, so it's no surprise, really. If, if anything, it's surprising that the extremes are not doing even better. It's surprising it's, that the extremes aren't doing better, could they? Well, I mean, uh, it will depend on how things evolve over the, uh, the coming years. But uh, my concern is that the, the bailout recipe that, that we are following now is the same failed one that we, fa that we followed between 2010 and 2015. Um, uh, therefore, I don't see how uh, this is going to lead to a strong recovery. If you add to that the fact that this government is quite hostile to the private sector and private investment, um, I don't see how even if they're able to complete this review, things will become noticeably better over the, the next few years. So yes, I am concerned. Yanis Koutsamidis, uh, you agree there is no light at this point at the end of the tunnel? Well, the light at the end of the tunnel is, uh, will come uh, if uh, the, the European partners in the Eurozone start to, to, to fund the Greek economy. The Greek economy is out of funds for the last, virtually the last six years. 
there are uh, enterprises, there are good companies in Greece that uh, cannot fund their activities. There are shops uh, closing down because they can't get uh, hold of a small loan of 10,000 euros. Uh, there are companies uh, laying off people because they can't afford their payrolls. So we have a fiscal crisis, we have a confidence crisis, and also we have a liquidity crisis. Well, the liquidity <laughs> can be uh, somehow solved in, if all these measures that the, the, the bailout agreement of last July come into fruition. That means the ECB should uh, put Greece back in its uh, funding uh, activities, uh, put the waiver back for the Greek banks, uh, start uh, funding uh, private, uh, state uh, corporations and also private corporations too. And also the, the Juncker plan, if there is real investments in Greece and new jobs created, maybe some confidence will come back. But overall, the, the sentiment is how Yanis described it. There is uh, real resentment. People are fed up with this situation for all these years. And this, this is a very critical point of how to turn back confidence into people's hearts and minds. Were, were you surprised to see uh, Alexei Tsipras uh, quick to go through with that reform this time. I say he, he, he did it before uh, this Monday meeting in Brussels. Well, uh, this, this uh, agreement had to, to be concluded until the end of 2015. We're already five months uh, behind schedule. But uh, what we need to take into account here is uh, that uh, Mr. Tsipras, his, his uh, political uh, calculator, he tries to minimize the, the effect that uh, all these measures have on his uh, political clientele. That means all these people that voted for him and believed that he can change the narrative of the Eurozone and have less austerity and have the Greek debt cut at least 50 percent. That was the initial uh, strategy back in 2015. Uh, now he sees all these uh, arguments that they cannot uh, be uh, viable. He, he even said yesterday, he, he admitted that he had delusions that he could win over the Eurozone. So it's, it's a big change of mentality also for the big Greek political system, the Greek people. The Greek people believe that there is a third way out of austerity within the Eurozone, which is not possible. And now people tend to realize that this is the way that will happen not for the possible. next decades. Not possible, even though there's growing calls for debt relief, even the uh, head of the IMF saying you have to do it? Yes, well, uh, just a few minutes before, before we went into the studio, there were uh, statements at the press conference at the Eurogroup saying that there won't be uh, a comprehensive uh, solution for the debt before 2018. So that means that Greece will be held hostage for the next two years at least. But we have to see the, the complete uh, statements after the show to, to see what's really, what really happened during today's Eurogroup. All right. Uh, uh, let's bring in on this uh, Alberto Gallo. Uh, do you think that there won't be debt relief until 2018? Well, you know, Greek debt is clearly unsustainable. I feel very sorry for, for Greece because this issue uh, is being used as, a, as an example for the bigger chessboard of, of how Eurozone debt will be treated. Uh, we know that Greek GDP is 2% of the Eurozone. It's like a city like Milan or Dusseldorf. So the issue is solvable. The problem is to find the political will. Now, why 2018? Because next year, 2017, we have German and French elections. And German elections, you can already see in the polls that, you know, protest parties, alternative for Germany, uh, are, are gaining ground. So, uh, obviously, German politicians are afraid that if they give too many concessions to Greece, then the electorate would turn against them. However, the longer a situation persists, the more you have you know, high unemployment, a young generation of people that has no hope, and the more in Greece you can see that you know, the uh, extremist parties can gain ground. So we're, on a very, very, we're walking a very fragile tightrope here. We know that Greek debt is unsustainable. There is a discussion around debt extension, so extensions of maturity. 
Now, we need to understand how significant these extensions are. Uh, we need to have at least something around 20, 30 year extension and potentially a reduction of interest or linking the interest to economic performance. We're basically facing a, a, a debtor that is not able to pay. Right, let's, so, let, let, let's talk about that. Greece's debt, yeah. it stands at 177% of GDP, uh, 321 billion euros worth of red ink. Uh, now it's nearly three quarters owned by the euro area and the IMF. We can see on this graph uh, with the Germans sitting on 40 billion worth uh, uh, of that uh, debt. Uh, Alberto Gallo, um, there was in March of 2012, um, what they call uh, in, in financial parlance a haircut, 53% of the debt uh, with private creditors was written off. Uh, it, 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 why can't public creditors do the same? That's the, that's the, the, you know, the great uh, political issue. In the private sector, if you have someone who has a mortgage and can't pay, you go to him, you talk to him, you negotiate. You're not going, you know you're not going to get back 100. The loss is already there. Uh, but you, you try to get back 50 or maybe 60 cents on the euro. Now, with Greece, things are a lot more complicated because politicians in Germany and other countries don't want to be seen as giving them a gift because they are afraid that otherwise other countries would ask for the same, uh, for the same treatment. However, we know the loss is already there. We know that debt is a 175 percent. It's going to probably go above 200 percent if growth continues to be you know, around zero or below zero, as it was in the last quarters. So you're looking at you know, a debt to GDP ratio of over 20 percent with foreign creditors you know, without, a, without Greece having its own central bank. So you're, you're almost at the level, you're getting close to Japan, basically, but Greece doesn't have the ability to print money. So we know we need to get a solution here. It's just that because of electoral issues in other countries, we want to kick the can a lot longer. Now, what I'm worried about is that at the moment, uh, you know, the, the politics are stable. But as we saw from the interviews, you know, we may not be able to wait for two years because the politics could become fragile and people could go on the street. So I think that we need to start the negotiation with a debt extension and also a fiscal plan like you know, Yanis mentioned the Juncker plan, for example, which has been stagnating for over a year. The, Europe, the, the European Commission has only spent 10 billion in the Juncker plan over the last, 10, over the last year and a half. 10 billion is 0.1 percent of Eurozone GDP, which is really not credible. The Juncker plan, just to remind our viewers, uh, which is this uh, money that uh, was set aside for stimulus for big infrastructure projects. Uh, you're saying, Alberto, a lot more could be done uh, a lot more could be headed to, towards places like Greece and towards Greece itself. Well, across all Europe, really, because without fiscal policy, without an agreement to stimulate the economy, we're just going to remain stuck in a zero interest rate environment. But we know the ECB cannot do the trick by itself. The ECB doesn't have superpowers. And zero interest rates at some point fail to stimulate the economy because savers realize they're getting less on their savings and so they spend less. So we need the fiscal arm, the political arm to do something as well. Central banks have done all they can do already. And that's true for Greece and it's true for the rest of Europe as well. Yanis Palaiologos, uh, what are you thinking when you hear, well, we got big elections in France and Germany next year, you'll have to wait till 2018. Well, you know, we're used to that uh, story now. I, I, I tweeted something earlier about how, you know, the first time that the, the Eurozone governments under pressure from the IMF uh, committed to offer Greece more debt relief uh, after the, the private sector haircut was in uh, November 2012. And at that point they said that, you know, if Greece is able to achieve a primary surplus and continues to implement the program, then we will give it further debt relief. And in 2014, when Greece achieved the primary surplus the previous year, uh, Germany and other countries uh, basically backed out of that commitment. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they made it again last summer. Uh, but there is, there is a great suspicion here that, uh, you know, we're always uh, being uh, promised things on certain conditions, and these conditions uh, are never met. And it's not because we don't meet them necessarily, but because uh, the, the goalposts are always moved.
Uh, Yanis Kutsumidis, uh, is it uh, uh, the goalposts moving? Whose fault is it? Well, I think uh, all parties uh, have their responsibilities <laughs> because back in uh, 2014, uh, the, the previous Greek government was supposed to conclude the, the previous memorandum, and, uh, but uh, they were too afraid uh, to go into real reforms and structural reforms and do the necessary uh, austerity in order to conclude the agreement. So we had the, the snap elections of early 2015 with the Syriza government promising to uphold all these arrangements of the bailouts. So uh, Greeks believed uh, this narrative and we came to, to the mid-2015 uh, crisis. But what I think the way out of this crisis could be right now is basically ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, should be depoliticized. Right now, in every single uh, decision that ESM has to take about debt of, of the Eurozone countries, some uh, ministers or uh, parliaments need to discuss very technical financial details. This has to become more technical. If, if uh, a country fulfills uh, conditionality, then the, the board of directors of the ESM should be able to make its debt more flexible. And we would have, we would have this discussion right now if all this uh, d debate wouldn't be so much politicized. Right now we have the head of the Social Democratic Party in Germany speaking against new austerity for Greece. The finance minister of Germany is speaking for new austerity for Greece. Uh, other countries speaking for and against. This is like a babble in, in Europe. This has to end. Otherwise it won't, be, it won't go anywhere. Right now, uh, Greece has suffered so much that it needs a way out. And a, a new way out would mean more flexible terms for the debt. To give you an example, the Greece has to fulfill 3.5% uh, of GDP primary surplus for the next decades. This is, besides being totally un unrealistic, it also takes away one of the key uh, elements of the fiscal policy. Greece cannot have its own fiscal policy for the next decades. This is not reasonable. Uh, fiscal policy should be counter-cyclical. In years that we have big growth, there should be more, uh, more uh, primary surplus achieved. And in years that we have maybe recession, we should lower, be able to lower the targets. There should be more flexibility. Right, right now, it's so stiff, all this program, that it's, it's totally unrealistic. All right. Cutting the debt uh, is obviously at the heart of this discussion. A reaction on Twitter. Lawmakers passed painful reforms to reach fiscal targets, which they won't reach. For six years, we've been completely dried up of money. That's on the hashtag F24 debate. Let me ask you, Yanis Paleologos, your book, The 13th Labor of Hercules, obviously a reference to... Uh, to Greek myths, uh, and, and let me ask you, uh, you know, in Greek mythology, there's Sisyphus, who uh, dares to defy the gods, his punishment, he carries a boulder up a mountain that uh, every day falls down to the bottom and he has to do it all over again. Uh, is, the, is that a fair analogy to the, to the current situation? And do, the, do these analogies to Greek myths annoy you? Well, actually, uh, I had considered using Sisyphus instead of Hercules uh, for the title, but I thought that would be too depressing, and I didn't want to be <laughs> completely pessimistic about the, the outlook. And I'm not. But, uh, you know, any fair description of what's been going on since 2010 is actually closer to, to Sisyphus than to Hercules. The, the book is more about our internal problems and how we arrived at the the sort of the, the fiscal collapse of 2010 and why it's been so hard to get out of it since then. But in terms of the way the the program has been set up and implemented, I think, unfortunately, Sisyphus is a better uh, analogy than, than Hercules. Yanis Koutsoumidis, you agree this is more a Sisyphean task than a Herculean one? Well, I think it's more a Herculean one, but uh, because I think it's all in the hands of the Greeks to, to make their lives better. I give you two examples. The, the Greek pension system, it's totally unsustainable. 
It's, uh, it has, uh, the Greek budget has to put up almost 20% uh, of its expenses to support an unsustainable pension system. This is something that the pension reform that was voted yesterday had to, uh, to correct. I'm, I'm not quite sure if this will be achieved because all this reform is about hitting new pensioners and not tackling the problems that uh, are right now uh, hurting the system. Another problem is the very, very high expenditure for uh, defence expenses. There is no, no discussion whatsoever about reforming Greek army. And I don't mean about making Greek uh, defences less effective, but it could be reformed because we have dozens of camps all around Greece that have nothing to do with real defences. So it, these are issues that Greek society, Greek politicians, Greek leaders are too afraid to, to catch on and speak uh, uh, openly to the society. There's, there's been a culture of hiding the problems under the rug, and which, is, which is unbearable for this situation that the country is right now. Uh, fear of reforming is something that seems to be paralyzing uh, all of Europe. Now, as the, this uh, discussion about debt uh, begins, let me ask you, Alberto Gallo, uh, we're seeing that uh, here in this country the president's gone in for a lot of criticism over fear of reforming. We know that uh, uh, when there was reform that was undertaken by the then Social Democrat Chancellor of Germany, Gerhard Schroeder, uh, he was voted out of office. Would you say that uh, all of Europe is frozen when it comes to reform, I see, is especially there's always something going on, an election, a Brexit referendum? Well, we have a couple of good examples where reforms have achieved some recovery. Uh, one is Ireland. Obviously, Ireland is in a special position. It's an English-speaking country. But, you know, they, they had a very heavy crisis with banks, uh, lose, you know, banks losing uh, a lot of money, debt to GDP going from 20 to, to you know, almost, you know, 100 percent, uh, and now it's coming back down again because they have reformed, they have fixed the banks, and they're now um, channeling investment, they're attracting investment. The same is true for Spain, actually. Spain had a very inefficient banking system, a big real estate bubble. They fixed the banks. They didn't hide the problem. They fired a lot of bank managers. A lot of them were also linked to the political class. And then we have other examples where reforms are a lot more difficult. And I would put there, uh, you know, Greece, Portugal, Italy, but even Germany. If you look at the some parts of the public sector, some parts of the banking system, they're very hard, uh, you know, they're still very inefficient. Now, in Greece, what are the priorities? Uh, the pension system, uh, Yanis mentioned it, very much unsustainable. You know, there's over 10 percent of, 15 uh, percent of GDP gets spent only on pensions. Um, and the other thing I would say is the legal system. It's one of the slowest in the developed world. So to, if something goes wrong, you're buying something from someone and there is fraud and it takes 10 years to get your money back, then this discourages investment and doing business, generally speaking. But obviously these reforms are very hard to, to implement and it takes a real political uh, you know, Hercules to, to do them. So we, we really need the, the current government to step up and, and take control. Uh, obviously, you know, Europe needs to do something on the other side because you can't do, we know that you can't do reforms and austerity at the same time. That's the key, that's the key point. Can't do reform and austerity. And that brings us uh, to, uh, well, uh, as one viewer puts it on the hashtag F24 debate, as usual, the real problem in this situation in, is Germany. Let's talk about it again. If you're just joining us, even the boss of the IMF now agrees, uh, Christine Lagarde, stating uh, that it's counterproductive to expect Greeks to, to meet their agreed target of a primary budget surplus of 3.5% of GDP in 2018 without debt relief. Agreeing with her, Germany's vice chancellor, who as leader of the Social Democrats, is in a grand coalition with Angela Merkel's Christian de de Democrats, Zygmar Gabriel crossing swords with the CDU over signs of a recovery in Greece. Uh, what some are now demanding, the next step in, this, in the savings program will destroy this little green shoot of economic recovery in Greece. For his part, the German finance minister Wolfgang Schäuble at that Monday uh, Eurozone finance ministers meeting uh, in Brussels, playing his cards close to his chest. 
What the IMF wants is one thing and what we have agreed is another, and then what the EU law allows is yet another. And if you add all this up, then it turns out that we are where we were last year. This needs to be implemented by accomplishing it. Yanis Kutsumid, it's your reaction. Well, uh, the, the, the pre-election period in Germany has just started, we may say. Uh, the, the SPD party, the Social Democrats, have, are, are faring very, very badly in polls. And uh, also, uh, Mr. Gabriel has been rumored of uh, either resigning or being replaced. So he needs to come up with some sort of a narrative, a center-left narrative that's missing from the Social Democrats of Germany. And right now they're trying to find what that narrative can be. Less austerity, more equality, they don't, they don't know yet. But they need to change their position from the CDU and uh, they know that they have to differentiate themselves from Mr. Schäuble because that's what, how they be, they've been seen in the eyes of the electorate so far. And can Wolfgang Schäuble and the CDU uh, stay, uh, uh, stay the course, hold their ground when they've got even their coalition partners against them as well as most uh, or at least part of Europe and the IMF? This is a very, very tough equation. We, we should take into account the rise of the uh, populistic uh, right-wing party, the Alternative for Germany, which is uh, polling at 15% uh, almost in the last few weeks, and also the, 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 the Liberals, the FDP, who were in the government in previous years, are also polling uh, high. So we could face uh, eventually a coalition in 2017 between the Christian Democrats, the populistic right, and the Liberals. And this, this is a nightmare scenario for many countries in Europe because it will be very nationalistic and very against any uh, way to, to promote uh, growth and economy around the country, uh, around the continent. So I think this is a very fragile situation in Germany we're facing right now. And I have some sympathy for Mr. Schäuble because he has faced some f severe criticism from his Bavarian uh, partners of the CSU and also from his uh, parliament group in the Bundestag. So he has to keep this balance. But eventually, at the Eurogroup of May 24, he needs to come up with a solution for Greece. Because if Greece crisis goes into June, then it will mix with the British referendum, and then that will not be very good at all. Yanis Palaiologos, uh, do you also have sympathy for Mr. Schäuble? Not uh, particularly, but uh, I, I have to, to comment that I think uh, we're overstating the significance of uh, Mr. Gabriel's comments. Uh, Mr. Gabriel has uh, uh, sort of gone this way and that uh, many times over the past uh, couple of years. He was fully on board with uh, the plan last year to threaten Greece with a temporary exit from the euro. He was fully on board with the 3.5% primary surplus target. Uh, and I don't think it's his voice that counts. The voices that count are Mr. Schäuble's and, and the Chancellor's, and they haven't really <laughs> moved from where they were. And, and the key issue here is that th they're stuck between uh, two red lines. The one red line is that they can't go to the Bundestag and ask their MPs to give more debt relief to Greece and to significantly lower the targets, but they also can't go to the Bundestag without the IMF. And in that context, I think it's been uh, very stupid on the part of our government to, instead of embracing the IMF's call for less austerity, to spend the last uh, few weeks attacking the IMF, when it's the IMF really who is the most powerful player who now supports the call for less austerity and more debt relief for Greece, which is what Mr. Tsipras was uh, elected to achieve a year and a half ago. All right, we've been talking about debt relief. There's the question is, who do you blame for bad debt? Now, this is the portion of the show where we talk tuna bonds. Dateline Maputo, capital of Mozambique, very far from Greece, where in 2013, the government got an $850 million loan arranged by Swiss bank Credit Suisse and Russia's VTB, this to finance fishing infrastructure. The cash came in the form of a government-backed bond to state uh, a tuna fishing company, 
and Matum, creditors and donors, which provide one quarter of Mozambique's state budget, are fuming after the admission that the government is now sitting on $1.3 billion in hidden loans. And I'm telling this story, Alberto Gallo, to ask you a simple question. Whose fault is it when this bad debt piles up? Well, look, you can, you know, you can talk about different factors. There is one factor which is common to all countries uh, in the periphery, uh, which in the past, before the euro, used to devalue their currency. So they used to borrow uh, more than they could, but then they devalued their currencies. Uh, basically, they printed money and they were able to pay back debt. But since the euro was introduced, effectively, these created an appreciation of these currencies, which before were recurrently devalued. And so these countries couldn't do this trick anymore. So are you and, suggesting uh, that Mozambique is in a levels. better place than Greece? I'm not making a comparison. I, I, I think that, that would be misguided. Uh, so you can talk about the euro as one of the reasons why Greece has high debt and has not been able to reduce it. There is also another reason. You know, governments in the past spent too much and they also didn't say the truth about their numbers when Greece was about to enter the, the euro. So that's another reason. Nevertheless, you know, creditors have lost some money and there is no point in keeping the loss uh, forever in, you know, without recognizing it, hoping that at some point you'll get your money back. You know, it's like give, you've given money to someone, you know that that someone cannot repay it. It's much better to negotiate rather than starve the debtor uh, to, to, and make him uh, get to a worse situation. So the amount you can recover is even worse. So, so there needs to be a solution. I think there is potential solutions that are negotiable, for, that are conditional to reforms. So, for example, a reduction in coupon conditional to reforms. This is something that every country in the periphery would benefit for because in the end ECB policy depends on Germany and France and Italy but doesn't follow Malta, doesn't follow Portugal, doesn't follow Greece. So if you have a recession you need additional counter-cyclical fiscal tools and these can be embedded in the in the government debt. So debt that is linked to growth that is more flexible would make Greece more sustainable, not, not just Greece, but it would be also a solution for other countries. Yanis Koutsoumidis, are there people in Brussels who are thinking along these lines? Well, uh, it seems that uh, there are people in the Commission who would like to hear uh, these growth-friendly measures for, for not only Greece, for other parts of Europe as well. We've seen in the last uh, few weeks that there are, there are some fiscal problems in Portugal, in Spain. Uh, also Italy, the structural uh, deficit of Italy is under discussion right now in, uh, in Brussels. And later this month, we'll have deliberations from the European Commission about the debt of these countries. So this, all th these things were not uh, debated in the previous pre-crisis years in Europe. Greece was able to borrow billions and billions of euros without being monitored by any institution. This, this was criminal. Right now, I think the situation is far better. Uh, we have a very reliable right now statistical office and uh, we should be able in the next years to, to uh, benefit from this uh, uh, governance that is taking place. But what we do right now is we have to be more flexible about that. It has, doesn't have to be a negative word in the AAA uh, cred, uh, credited countries. There has to be more flexibility and more fiscal space for when the years are, are better, when there is more growth, there can be more revenue and maybe more austerity when we have revenues and less austerity when there is recession. This is something that has to come back to the, to the powers of the national governments. When do you expect the fault lines to, to, to move? Are you really saying that uh, because of the Brexit <coughs> referendum, again, because of those elections in 2017, we're not going to see a change of philosophy for, for a long, long time? 
Yes, the, the, we, we shouldn't take only uh, Germany into account. There are other countries that are very reluctant with such de debate. Let's say Finland, uh, the Netherlands as well. They're very sensitive with the debt issue. I was, I was on Dutch television last night and they're very, very uh, sensitive of how Greece is faring with this debt. So uh, there are, this is not only a German sensitivity. There are a lot of countries in the Eurozone that see Greece as uh, uh, an example that should not take place again. But on the other hand, we should give Greece uh, an opportunity to grow again, to create jobs and to become more flexible, but also be monitored very strictly in the next few years of how it's doing with its uh, fiscal stance. Yanis Palaiologos, at this point in time, despite everything, despite all of the hardship, a majority of Greeks still want to stay inside of the Eurozone. Are they right? I think so, though I should note that the numbers have been slipping over the last uh, 12 months, and that's another worrying development. Um, I think, you know, uh, governments before uh, we joined the Eurozone uh, where had the free hand in economic policy, they implemented uh, appalling policies which really created the conditions for the later fiscal collapse of the country. And uh, they were able to put off any kind of uh, restructuring and any kind of improvement because they could devalue. The euro is a, a very useful disciplining mechanism if we can use it to reform and become more competitive. So far, we haven't been able to do that, but I think it would be much better for us to achieve that within the Eurozone than to try to go our own way outside it. Much better to achieve it inside of the Eurozone. Al Al Alberto Gallo, where again, there's that, um, you're in London, where there's gonna be that Brexit uh, referendum. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on uh, what happens to the likes of Greece if there is a Brexit? Would that be good news or it wouldn't matter or bad news? I think Brexit is bad news for everyone. There are various estimates of how the uh, growth uh, estimates for the UK would change with the Brexit. They range between minus 1 and minus 3 percent of GDP. So a, a, a substantial loss of growth. These are estimates by the OECD, by uh, the London School of Economics and so on. And I think that, um, you know, but what about for the Greeks? The world, no, 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 this is for the UK. Right, but for so the this Greeks. this is how bad it would be for the UK, right? Now, um, clearly, one thinks about Brexit as a negative thing for the UK in particular, which it is, but uh, it also introduces a precedent that the Eurozone can be, that the European Union can be more fragile. Um, so, you know, there are now in the world, around the world, a lot of parties, a lot of politicians that are recommending quick fix solutions to, to the electorate. I mean, we see this in the UK, we see it in the US, we see it in Greece, we see it in Spain with Podemos. And, you know, the reality is that there are no quick fixes. The only solution here is to get on a table and, and uh, get at the table and work together to reform the financial system and to allow a quicker restructuring of sovereign debt when we know that uh, the amount of debt is unsustainable. Yeah, and um, I'm seeing, by the way, just, just, just Alberto, one of our viewers reacting, saying the UK should take a good look at what the EU and Germany are doing to Greece with the proposition of Brexit. Is the Greek crisis fueling the Brexit camp for those who are for leaving the EU? Well, look, I, I think the Brexit camp is just uh, looking at any, any factor uh, to, to, to make a case. Um, one of them is sovereignty, uh, another one is, you know, trying to, to look at Greece or other examples. I mean, the UK is a very different economy and there is no relationship between the UK and Greece. And the UK is not even in the Eurozone, so it has its own monetary policy. So there's a lot of misguided considerations here uh, by, uh, I would say, by the Leave campaign. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is no doubt that a lot of the UK economy, uh, the biggest partner of the UK is continental Europe, 50 percent of imports and exports. So a Brexit would be bad for the UK. It would also be bad for other European countries because you would lose a big partner. 
um, you know, what is the cost of staying in the EU? A lot of people say it's compromising on sovereignty, but it is something that every country does uh, every time when you're in agreements, whether it's defense or, uh, or trade. Okay. So, um, I, 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 so I think the battle Europe around is what you're saying. Alberto Gallo, we're going to have to leave it there, but I want to thank you for joining okay. us from London. I want to thank Yanis Paleologos for being with us from Athens. Yanis Koutsimidis for being with us from Hania in Crete. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next.